and risk their life when they do theater uh, on a regular basis. So it's really extraordinary to be in their company. Oh my gosh, Nick, <laughs> we're growing. We're growing as a panel. Yeah. I think uh, if the audience will become... Uh, yeah, in, uh, everyone's going to come. I'm sorry, That's Nick. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Yep. The reason is we thought we would separate resilience and laughter, and then we thought who can separate resilience and laughter. So we're all together. And before I introduce every single one of these very courageous people, we just had another person who risks his life when he does his work, Nick Kauser, who's a cartoonist. Um, we're going to go to Reem who is there with us virtually because Reem has to leave us because of Ramadan. So we're gonna start with Reem. Reem, talk about deja vu all over again. Uh, this is a wonderful moment to have you with us. Reem El Saya is one of our lab fellows. She is a Syrian living in England. We first got to know Reem four years, five years ago exactly this way, when Reem was working as one of the actresses on a fantastic project which was then called Syria the Trojan Women, which was a group of Syrian refugee women who performed Euripides' Trojan Women, interweaving their own stories of escape from Syria into Euripides' play. We got to know Reem this way because she was not given a visa to travel to perform. And so all of the cast assembled in Amman, Jordan, at three in the morning, their time, so that they could join us virtually for a program we held here in this auditorium uh, which was very generously introduced by the president of the university, Zach DeJoya. And it makes me so happy to see you and so sad to see you that way and not actually with us. This many years later, and this is exactly where we are in the same position, where you're still not able to travel here. Uh, and usually we try to come to you, but this time it wasn't possible. So Reem, in your journey from Syria to Jordan to England, where you now live, theater has played a very important role. Would you share with us a little bit about that story, what theater has been for you? Please. Thank, thank you, Cynthia. Um, and um, first of all, I'm so happy and thrilled to be with you, even virtually. Um, thanks for technology. Um, and thank you for um, having me um, in this panel. Uh, thank you for the question. Actually, without the theater, I won't be here with you. Uh, I mean, I won't be in the UK, I won't be uh, one of the lab fellows, I won't be uh, now talking to you at this moment. So theater has changed my life, um, truly. Um, it started with the Syrian Trojan women back in Jordan. Um, and they told us that they wanted women to tell their own stories on the, on, on the stage. And um, to be honest, I didn't have any kind of experience in theater. So that was the first time that I stand on the stage and it was to tell my own story, how I left Syria to Jordan. Uh, so it was a sad story, but at the same time, I met so many women who did the same. So we, went, we were 25 women. Um, theater was so powerful. Uh, and I noticed that, especially when I came here to the UK. So I came here to the UK to do a second version of uh, Syrian Trojan Women. It's called Queens of Syria. And, um, but the stories were different. And there were new women and there was like a new kind of uh, director. Um, so it was like kind of the same idea, the same abstract, but it, in a different way. And we did a tour all around the UK. and. For the first time, I noticed that there were people who are interested about the, the Syrian crisis. Um, it was so moving when you saw people crying while they are listening to your story, crying while they are listening to the other stories in, 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 the, in the play, when they are all with you 
in the end when they all like stand up and, and clamp for, for, for us. Um, and many people said that you are so brave to be able to stand on the stage and do this. So theater is much about the truth. It wasn't like for me, it wasn't like acting. Um, I, I performed my story. I didn't like act because it was something from the heart of my heart. It wasn't something that I pretended or something that I created. It was my own story. Um, so theater was the, the gateway for me to start speaking up, to start telling people about what's happened to, uh, to me, what, uh, what was going on in, in Syria. Um, and theater is amazing in, in the way that it presents itself. Like you don't have this physical barriers, you don't have the screen barriers at all. So you can feel the connection with the people eye to eye, uh, the emotions. Um, so yeah, I believe that theater changed my life. And uh, now I'm doing another thing called Disparate Journeys, which is a simulation. So it's like immersed uh, theater. And we we're telling the story of refugees um, by making the people stand or in, have, walk in the refugees' shoes. So theater was, from the beginning till now, was a way for me to be more brave. Um, it was a way for me to be able to tell my story. It was my ch channel to the world. And um, I'm so happy to be able to do that. I mean, I won't be able to do that without many people who help me. Um, so, yeah, what I, can I say more? Um, Bree, maybe tell us a little. I believe. I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about, between these two projects, you said that for um, the Queens of Syria, you're not really acting because you're performing your own story. And then yeah. Desperate Journeys. Has anyone here experienced de Desperate Journeys? Do you know this way? Where uh, the, the audience actually participates, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Um, yeah. Did, uh, talk a, bit, a little bit about those two different experiences. Do you find, do they have a similar impact, do you think, on the audience? Different? And also, I want to invite but, people here. If you have a question for Reem, since she will have to leave us earlier than the others, I'm going to give you the chance to talk with her now before she has to. Go ahead, Reem. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, so yeah, Disparate Journeys was absolutely a different experience uh, because you have to be in touch with the audience. You have to make them be involved in the story itself. Um, so I played the role of um, um, a refugee in, uh, in one of the camps. And I had to say that I was stuck in the camps, etc. cetera. Um, but to be honest, I'm as a refugee, I've never been in a camp. So it was, it was for me to live the experience to, for other refugees like me. And it was too real. Um, and by the way, I know so many people who have been in, through this uh, experience. Um, so it's helped me to know and to touch how it was uh, to live in a camp. And I was able to pass it to the other people who were like kind of stuck with me in the camp as well. And of course it was, all about the decision making, the, the struggle of decision making. You always have choices to make, but all of these choices are too bad, <laughs> equally too bad. Um, the, the most amazing thing, amazing thing about this journey is it was the, the thing after the performance, because I had to stand in, in front of the people and tell them my, my own story uh, as, as a person. Um, which is similar to the to the thing that I've done in, in, in Trojan women and queens of Syria. And I was like, you you can feel how shocked they were because they know that this is all virtual. This is not like kind of true. But when they know that this person in front of us had to make the same decision that we had to do and he, he faced the same terrifying things. Um, so it was very important to, for me, to be in touch with people, both like in, in within the, the journey inside of the, the simulation or the theater and after it. So that's that's built something inside of the people that 
they can now understand more. They can be more empathetic when they listen to the to the to the to the news. They won't just uh, stay in their bubble. They they now know what's exactly it is. They won't judge refugees. They won't say that why they left or why they they are going why they want to come to our countries, etc. So I hope that I made a change for the people who watch me on the theater, uh, rather if it was uh, the first Syrian Trojan women or Queens of Syria or Disparate Germanies, I, I wish, uh, I hope, I don't know if I did, but I hope that I passed the, the message that I wanted to pass. And I hope that what I've done has changed something in them as much as it's changed something inside of me. Thank you so much, Reem. I want to give um, the panel and also people in the audience a chance to ask you a question before you need to leave. I want to just um, remember one decision that, that you had to make and your family had to make, which was uh, a, a, a very difficult one, a very challenging one. Derek and I were lucky enough to be able to go see the last performance of Queens of Syria <coughs> in London two summers ago. And Reem told me the day before when I saw her that her family unit, which was six people in the play, had made the decision that they were going to stay behind in England and seek refugee status. And that meant that, but at that point, the rest of the cast didn't know. And so they were all performing on stage this play that they'd built together and been working on together for four years. And you know, I, Derek and I knew, and they knew that they would never do that again, because they would never be with those people again. And two cast members already had done this when you performed in Switzerland, so they were then living in Germany, and this you know, terrible choice that, that we then saw later in the evening when the whole cast, you know, knew, and of course some of them would have loved to stay, but they had their families in Jordan that they had to return to. And, you know, these really just heart-rending decisions playing out in, in real life. Um, but we have to also commend you, Reem, for the incredible job you've done since you've been in England, Reem has recently graduated from college. She was really the English speaker for her extended family, so the ambassador to Great Britain for her extended family, who are all learning English now too. But uh, you know what you've accomplished in a short time is is really uh, breathtaking. Uh, but I would love to open it up for anyone who has questions uh, for Reem. Oh, this is, excuse me, I haven't even introduced you yet. This is a, a dear friend of the lab, Nick Hauser, who happily lives here in Virginia now because, strangely, the Iranians don't want him. Uh, and he's a cartoonist and also a researcher and activist around issues of water, particularly in Iran. Uh, thank you very much, Cynthia. Uh, many people in the world do not know about the experience of Syrian people, especially from the Hasaka province, before the civil war. Many people had to migrate from Hasaka to other cities, to the margins of other cities in the western side of the country. Uh, do you also talk about the, that experience of first migrating from inside the country to another part inside the country? And so many of those people have also had to leave the country again. So it has been different phases of hardship and migration. Were you able to hear that? Okay, Reem. Uh, I just the last bit. Is it like what's the difference between the two things? Uh, yeah. Do you does your work reflect the situation that those yeah. people have had in that first phase and then going to the other uh, phase first inside the country yeah. and being unwanted in the country yeah. and then going outside of the country? Uh, well, well, sure. Because um, I had to experience that, like. Uh, I left my home after a, a massacre, like there was a massacre happened near near my, my home in Syria. And next morning we had all to flee. And um, that was one of the most horrible days in my life. 
um, and not just my, my family, all of our district, like all of the people were trying to leave. Um, and then we were like moving and we, we moved in more than six times within six months, um, trying to find safe place. And in the end, when we found that we have no place, no safe place to stay, and my dad was afraid that my brother's going to be taken to the military service, and you know what that means. Like he's either be a killer or he will be killed. Either this or that. Um, so my dad decided that it's the time to leave to Jordan. And from Jordan, um, I came to the UK for for Queens of Syria, and we decided to. Um, I had my mom with me and my two sisters with me. They were actually in the play. Uh, they had rules in the play. Um, so we decided to stay along with my other two aunts who were with us as well in, in the cast, as Cynthia mentioned, and we decided to, to stay here in the UK. So I had it all. Like I, I left my home in Syria many times. Um, actually, I went back to my home like for two days, and then we had to flee again because there was a booming. So it's 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 a very long story. I hope I have like more time. I'm I'm happy to tell it because I've I've told my story many times and. I'm happy to share it with anybody. But yes, of course, um, uh, when we did the story journeys, I helped with editing the, the, the text of, of the play. And I put so many things that happened to me and my family. Um, and which including much of, of what's happened to, to us and uh, what's happened to many refugees. I was lucky to not be, be in a camp, but I have lots of family members who've been in camps for a while, um, and I have friends who've been in camps as well. So I kind of know about it, but I never experienced it myself. Um, so yeah, I hope that uh, would answer the question. Does anyone in the audience, are there questions uh, for Reem before? Sure. Oh, sorry. Go uh, go ahead. I think you, I don't know if we can. Yeah, you want the mic? No, I, that's no. not going to work. I'll, I'll repeat it. Go ahead and ask it, and I'll repeat it. an interesting question. The question is, what were the differences, um, Reem, in the responses of the audiences in Jordan in comparison to the audiences in Europe, in England and in Switzerland? Thank you. Well, I think that we have to ask the question about uh, what is the theater situation in both countries? Is the situation of the theater in Jordan as an art like or the same as the UK? I believe no. Um, we have a theater movement in Jordan. It's not that big. It's not very popular. People watch TV, uh, watch cinema, but they don't really go a lot to um, to the theater. Um, and we only did like two uh, nights, two performances only in Amman. So it's hard to tell. Uh, we didn't have that big uh, audience, but we had like a very good reaction like uh, people loved the thing that we've done and we had audience like both Jordanian and Syrian and from other nationalities uh, obviously uh, from the UK because uh, it was a UK company who've done uh, the, the play uh, back in Jordan uh, but when we came here to the UK it's absolutely different it's absolutely different like we've been interviewed we had like full audience um, for all of the 17th uh, performances that we've done here. Um, people will stay, talk to us. Um, we had like five stars in the Times and, and uh, another journal that I can't remember the name. Um, as I said, we had like a full media coverage. So we we're like uh, movie stars for, for, for almost a month. So of course it's, it was different, but as I said, it's because people give value to the theater here more than Jordan. This is this is maybe uh, the thing. It's not about the play itself or or what the play uh, speaks about. That's interesting because I suspect your your question was a little more about what was the reaction to the stories that they were presenting. Yeah, 
Yeah, and so you did. I think the question was more about what was the reaction uh, mm. to the story. Well, you I, were I believe telling. I believe it's the same because we had like a very good reaction for our uh, from our audiences uh, when we were in um, in Jordan. But but as I said, it was like only two nights. We didn't have much people as well attending. Most of the people who attended were um, families of the women who who've been performing performing the play. Uh, but we had like a very good reaction, like uh, people really received it uh, very well, to be honest. Um, we, we had like some media coverage, but it wasn't that much, actually. It was very low profile. Yeah. Thank you, Reem, so much. I think you told us okay. you need to leave us around now. If you would like to stay, we would love to have you stay and be part of the panel. Uh, I have five minutes. <laughs> I mean, okay. Five minutes. Uh, I'm going to have to turn to yeah. some of the other panelists because we have a bit of a crowd up here. But yeah. I just want to, <laughs> but, but I do want to make sure there's, does anyone else have a question for Reem? And then you feel free to join in. Um, oh, we do have to, okay. Let's do, do both questions really quickly. Why don't you just go ahead, we'll ask them both and give you a chance to answer them both. And I can, re I can repeat it if you don't have a mic. Yeah, hi Reem. Um, because this panel hi. is made up not only of resilience, but also humor. Does humor, how does that play a part in your work, either in the rehearsal process or in the actual performances? Okay, so a question about humor, and what is your question in the back? And we'll do it at once, please. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, I, I was working on a project recently that exposed me to uh, metal bands that have been coming out of Syria and, and other countries in sorry, the Middle sorry, East. Sorry, what has been coming out? Me metal, like metal oh. genre music. Um, bands that have been coming out of Syria and um, uh, operating more in Denmark and the Netherlands and the UK. And I just wanted to know, Reem, if you are in contact with any other artists uh, in, in the UK who, whether they play music, they do theater, if you're aware of anything that's going on. So one is how much does humor play a part in your work? And two, are you in touch with other Syrian artists who also have moved to England, such as, for example, metal, heavy metal bands or any other Syrian artists who are in England now? Yeah, thank you. Uh, about the humor, um, there is like, um, when we did the first play, The Syrian Trojan Woman, there was no humor at all. It was like all sad. Um, but about the other one, which is Queens of Syria, we had like a, a, like a tiny bit of, of, uh, of humor because we wanted also to tell the people about uh, Syria before the war. And, um, and to be honest, we as Syrian, we love to love of, of, of like, or love, uh, or try to make humor out of uh, the agony that we have. So we have lots of black comedies, I mean, before, during, and I believe after the crisis, hopefully, when the war ends. Um, so there was like a little bit of a humor in, in the second one. But uh, because most of those stories that we have is sad, it was like harder for us to show the humor, but we were trying to tell the bright side. I'm speaking about Queens of Syria, which is the one that we've done here in the UK. We were trying to speak about the bright side, uh, what, Suri, uh, what, uh, what kind of uh, countries was Syria before the war, what was um, our lives before the war, et cetera. Um, so that we, we, we were trying to, to show the bright side more than like the humor, but there was like a humor bit in, 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 in the play because we were trying to ask the the um i was uh, that was my part to ask to go to the audience and just start asking them the questions that any journalist is going to do to ask a refugee in the camps and like some of them really loved about it because it's quite funny but at the same time it's sad so it was like like a dark comedy somehow uh i hope that will answer the question and about the other question well, to be honest, it's a, it's a bit hard for me. I have connection with artists like from the UK, from other places, uh, but I have connections with, um, you know, people that I worked with before, but they came here to, not to the UK, to, um, to Europe in general. Um, so I'm, I'm afraid that I don't have 
like I have the connection, but 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 only with people that I knew before. Um, it's um, I don't know, maybe it's something that um, I had to work on. Uh, so thank you to uh, to make me kind of uh, think about it uh, because I should. Uh, but I already have um, a good connection with uh, with people, especially the people who work with us in uh, in. Uh, the Syrian Trojan women and in Queens of Syria, uh, but many of them actually not here in uh, in the UK. They most of them in in France actually. France got all of the artists and like, you know, the the art people. Green, thank you so much. You have a number of thank your you. lab fellow lab fellows here, <laughs> so I wonder if you could just sure. end by just you know we all miss you so much and wish you were here actually with us. Yeah. But I wondered if you could just end with just just a couple of sentences about what it has been like being a lab fellow. Well, uh, uh, it's one of the most amazing things that ever happened to me. I loved being with a group of people from all around the world that I found things that I that we share, values that we share, um, art that we share. Um, it's amazing to to be part of uh, of uh, this thing. Like I met people from Cambodia, from uh, Colombia. Uh, like it's it's very special. You feel that you're special, no doubt, and you feel empowered to do more and more. Well, we feel you're really special too, and thank you, thank you for joining us. We really, really appreciate it. Sending you a big thank you so much. And someday we're going to get you here in person. Everybody vote. Uh, <laughs> I would love, before we go any further, I want to at least tell you who these other wonderful people are, starting with Shahid Nadim at that end, our dear friend from Pakistan uh, who runs Ajoka Theater. We had them here and did a production together with Ajoka a number of years ago, Amrika Chalo. Uh, we'll come back to it maybe in the comedy part, but it's a wonderful play that takes place in an American consulate, makes equal fun of both sides. They were desperate, apparently couldn't find anyone to play the ambassador, so I had to play it in that uh, play. And um, one of the, you know, the tests to, to get a visa were things like arm wrestling and licking each other without blinking. And uh, in the end, terrorists come, and of course, they want visas too, so. It, it, everyone had a good laugh at each other through that, which showed the revelation to our Washington audiences that, newsflash, Pakistanis have a sense of humor. So that was uh, an important new idea. Uh, and uh, then we have next to Shahid Iman Aoun. I hope many of you were able to see Ashtar Theater's beautiful production of Oranges and Stones last night. Uh, yeah. Iman works in uh, Ramallah, but also all over, but that's where she's based. Uh, next to her is uh, Joanna Sherman, who works at Bond Street Theater, runs Bond Street Theater, and they work all over the world, but particularly has, has been a long presence in Afghanistan, and I want to particularly focus on that, but also now Malaysia, Myanmar, and really many, many countries uh, with using theater to tell stories, to empower people, to communicate messages in a very powerful and engaging way. Next to Joanna, we're so happy to have with us one of our friends from Cambodia. You heard yesterday how much Cambodia is a part of Derek's and my life at Georgetown and at the lab through our Centennial Lab. And for the past two years in Cambodia, we have had a session with Sopek Song, who is really a, like a one-man institution of drama, spoken drama in Cambodia, and who, like many of the people on this panel, uh, takes huge risks and takes on challenging subjects, issues in society that is a very dangerous thing to do in Cambodia with this extremely authoritarian government and you will hear about that momentarily. Next to me is Faisal Abu al Haya, another one of our... Oh, Haija, Haija. Oh, Haija, I'll never get that right. Um, <laughs> you're gonna do a spelling test after that. Um, <laughs> you're right, Abu al Haija, 
who is one of our other lab fellows. You can see they obey us, they do what we say, they respect us. <laughs> Uh, who we have known here at Georgetown for 10 years, I think more than that, even more over 10 years, who first came here with the Freedom Theater from Janine Palestine and performed The Island. Uh, and that is a play, The, uh, the Island, famous um, anti-apartheid play, initially performed in South Africa, took really relatively little translation to place it in the West Bank or in the Middle East with Palestinian prisoners held by the Israelis. And that was a really, it's such a searing, impressive production. And my students still talk to me about that production. They still remember. Oh, wow. oh thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and finally, as you heard, Nick Hauser, a very close friend of the lab uh, who lives here and wor worked as a cartoonist in Iran until he made a cartoon that the government did not find very funny. And, we'll <laughs> and I became Abel Hijack. And I am Hijack. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> so um, we're going to begin with Sopek, um, who's going to give us, and I, I feel very badly. Several people asked me if they could show videos, and I said, no, no, it's going to take too much time. And then Sopek said, well, I have videos to show you. And so he's <laughs> as the one, so everyone else does too, but I, I forbade them. And <laughs> since Sopek traveled the longest, we're going to let him <laughs> show his video. <laughs> and next to Sopek, of course, you will recognize in her civilian clothes, Poonam Pin, the one who was bending in every impossible direction yesterday in the beautiful dance uh, for our Cambodian piece. And Poonam's going to help a little bit with Sopek um, translating. But if he needs me. I if he needs you. Um, but Sopek, would you like to just tell us, do you want to show the video uh, first? Uh, Which would you like to do first? What Use your mic, you. please. Hello, I'm from Cambodia. Yes, I'm sincere to sincere and everyone to give me a chance to join the, the, this program and I learn a lot from all of you. Yeah, and uh, what inspired me to do theater in Cambodia? Yet, yeah, uh, I want to show the video that inspired me to do theater in Cambodia first, uh, 10 years ago. Yeah. On a backpacking trip to Cambodia, I was um, traumatized myself after the first day there. It spans eight football fields. It is 100 feet deep. Its stench carries for miles. And it is where the poorest of Cambodians' desperately poor children eke out a living. This massive garbage dump in Cambodia's capital city offers up scraps of glass and metal these children sell for less than a dollar a day. The children are here because they have nowhere else to go. Many of them have lost their parents, and this dump site is a lifeline for their survival. Former Hollywood executive Scott Neeson was on vacation when he saw the dump for the first time. It shattered my world. It was like walking from... You know, the, the yeah. Uh... I worked with him for 10 years, uh, yeah, and I always go with him to dump site in Phnom Penh. And my people in Phnom Penh city is, uh, they don't know about the dump site, how they, how the, the people from the, the province to live in the dump site, how the kids that, how they live there, yeah, and how they go to school, yeah, eat everything, uh, my people in Phnom Penh, they don't know. Yes, just a little, a little. Yes, yeah, so I go with him every, every day. And then how, how can I help them? How can I, all the children to express, to show the, my people in Cambodia, in Phnom Penh, to so, I need your help. Yeah. So I, I, may, I, I go with, I go to the morning and afternoon and night to meet all people in the dump site to interview and then I, wrote the script, and then I play in the Phnom Penh in the big theater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and I, just to give you a sense of how difficult the climate is to do this kind of documentary theater that is revealing negative aspects of society, I saw another one of our lab fellows in a, a con contemporary dance festival, which they now hold every year in Phnom Penh. And in one of the dances, there were some uh, there were some handicapped people dancing, and the representative from the Ministry of Culture said, "This is not appropriate for Cambodia. We do not want this kind of thing in Cambodia. Cambodians can't understand this kind of complexity. We art is just for entertaining, and it should just be beautiful. So in that climate." It's quite a different thing to do what Sopek does. Yes, all all the the kids they from the dumb side. Yeah, my actor and actress they they real real life on the stage they show the their story. Yes, ten thousand audience. Yeah, to 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 see the this, this show. Yeah. So we're now seeing pictures of the production. Yeah, which is yeah. being performed by the people who actually live on the dump site. Yes, is that yeah. correct? Yeah, and uh, and then uh, my my uh, my Ministry of the Culture they call me and they say that uh, I am a lie. Yeah, not true. Yeah, or not true. Yeah. <coughs> yes, uh, ten years ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then I, I stopped do it. Uh, just uh, two, last two years ago, that I made the other one story, the the driver home. That, uh, yeah, and the uh, driver home is the story I love. It's a, uh, the story right ten before Pol Pot. Yeah, nineteen ninety, nineteen ninety so yeah, a story yeah. that was written in, and a yeah. well-known story in Cambodia, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, 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 uh, uh, my people they know about the story, but uh, the story is still powerful now. Mm. Yeah, but uh, before uh, the story in the, the book in the school, not not in the theater. Yeah, I I transformed to to, to the theater, and then uh, it's talk about the corruption. Yeah, and so the story of, of Driver Hum is a story about corruption that is very well known. Was it still in the school books? In in yeah, 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 today yeah, 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 still yeah. in yeah, the still, school still. books. Yeah, still, still. Yeah, this uh, what happened uh, uh, before uh, on stage. Yeah, before on stage one day, and I rehearsed all, and then the my my main actor accident class. Car class. Yeah. So, and you have the very strong feeling that yeah. it was not an accident. Yeah, the big, big sitter in Phnom Penh. Yeah. And the, they they say that they uh, they cannot. The doctor say that uh, they did not him a go to performance, but he he yeah. <laughs> Again, please. So just so it's clear, this is one of the main actors in this performance of Driver Hum. On his way to rehearsal, he was in a very serious car accident, which, so it's, go ahead. It's like they did the show, and they rehearsed the show, and then in the theater that day, one day before the show begins, there's someone like sit at the back, like he didn't say like it's from the government, but we believe that the government actually warned him not to perform that show because it's something that is critical to the corruption in Cambodia. And then on that day, like two, like after the main actor left the theater, he got hit by the car. Like we don't believe this is an accident, but still, two hours before the show start, people came to the theater like it was full house and everything. And the doctor said, "No, you cannot go to perform." But the main actor still, he said, "No, I need to perform. This is important to my country. It's important to my team." So they allow him, and then the, the show still happened. But he was on the wheelchair for the whole time, with the doctors well, two in doctors the wing stage. This has happened in 2017. Oh, 
So here's the main actor who performed on stage in the wheelchair for one hour. And this happened in 2017. Okay. Yeah. And uh, my actor, they yes, my actor not they not happy, and then they suggest me to do it again. We, they uh, they want to freedom walk and play on stage. They don't like on the chair. Yes, not freedom. So they let me do it again. Yeah, and. Yeah, and uh, this theater, uh, the government not allowed me to do, and then I go to find the other place, other theater, but not easy. But I have one one theater, it's small. Yeah, I do it. Yeah, and my actor, the freedom performance. Yeah. So it, you know, it's very moving to hear this opaque because a couple of days ago we were talking about Wroclaw Havel who performed in apartments, also of course not able to perform in theaters, and uh, you know eventually became president of the Free Czech Republic. I don't know if that's gonna happen quite so quickly in <laughs> Cambodia, but, but much more seriously, you know, seeing these stories performed live in front of people so they can actually see them and see your courage in writing them that is really, really important for people. Uh, so, um, and I know, yeah, do we want to? <laughs> do you, what would you? Do? What is it? I'm going to see again. The last performance. Oh, the last Okay, okay. okay. Uh, can you explain what it is, or Poonam, can you explain? <laughs> So this is the last performance of the Driver Hum from last year. From last year. And just so you know, that, that is a really large theater in, Cambo in Phnom Penh, full of people. And unlike England or so many other countries, what I was hearing from Irina about Russia, theater in Cambodia, spoken word theater, basically happens when you put something on as I understand it. There's really not anyone else doing it. Um, and really no support uh, for his work, but you can see when he does do it, uh, people come out and in, in large. People. Yeah, why don't you speak like, something uh, about this? <laughs> a lot of them are young people, which is amazing to see like young people in Cambodia come and support and learn about what happened in our country. Even those like, he got called from the police or from the government people, like, don't do that. Just, they they chat him, they said what he did, it's not true, it's not happened in Cambodia, like, he's, he's a liar and everything. But we still have people who believe in his work and they come to see the show, which is really amazing. Uh, I, I think I'm gonna have to, do, would you like to just add one more thing? Then I'm yeah, gonna well, need to well, move on. One more thing, no, yeah. Well, I don't think we have time for one but more I, video. I, I'm so sorry. I, I, because we have, I have to talk to the other people. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what? You know what? We'll have a little conversation and maybe come back to you. Okay? Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sopek. Um, and, you know, we're very lucky at the lab to have uh, supporters, supporters in all different ways, people who support us by housing our artists, people who support us by helping us bring uh, our artists here, and we're lucky to have with us one of those support, two of those supporters 
uh, Christy Platt and Al Munzer. So thank you so much, Al Munzer, who brought, helped us bring SOPEC here. And it, you can see what a difference it makes. Christy, who will be housing Mr. Al Haja no. <laughs> soon. I got Haja, Haja. Abu. Oh, I know, Abu Haja. I know that. I know, I was just trying to get the last part right. It's uh, so only the last Abu part of the problem, yes. <laughs> Uh, and we appreciated very much another one of our supporters, uh, Samia Faruqi, was not able to be here because she's ill, but she made it possible for you to get a visa and all those lawyers, which was hugely, hugely important. I want to turn, since we're on Palestine, we have two people from Palestine here with us, and I'm going to turn to... In, you're ready to take over. I'm going to turn to Iman first, and just to give us a sense, we've seen here the challenges, but also the impact of theater in Cambodia, taking up subjects that no one else is touching. Can you give us a sense of how you feel about the impact of your theater, who it touches, and how, and what are some the most severe challenges that you're facing? Um. Well, thank you. Um, Ashtar Theater that was uh, established in 91, uh, we started as the first and only theater school in Palestine uh, at that time. Because, uh, before, we didn't have any um, theater school regular or for young people uh, to study theater. So the impact of the work that was done over the years um, had left many groups that were able to create um, either similar programs of uh, training uh, young people um, in, in different cities um, and establishing a very um, uh, thorough theater movement at the, mo at, at the moment in Palestine, especially in the West Bank and, and Jerusalem and Gaza. Um, so, uh, so this kind of continuous, um, uh, like, um, continuous building, continuous uh, um, spreading uh, of the theater movement uh, in our community uh, is an important matter, especially because um, when we speak about theater in Palestine, for those of you who, who know and those who do not know, we, uh, we do not really have theater, well, we do have theater buildings, of course, uh, in different uh, cities, but we do not have the rhythm of the audience to come uh, regularly uh, to see performances because uh, it only happens in uh, Jerusalem and in Ramallah. The rest of the, uh, of the places we had, and we still have, to really work hard in order to build the audience because the people are not um, are not in a, in a position that they feel that uh, theater is uh, is important for them uh, they are not also in a position where they feel that uh, oh life is is easy so um, I want to go for entertainment therefore that had uh, um, given uh, the space for many of the uh, of the theater makers to think differently, to think of how to go to the uh, to the community wherever the community is, and this is how um, in in ninety seven Ashtar Theater introduced uh, the theater of the oppressed uh, into Palestine and started to really um, create uh, different groups and, and stimulate um, different community um, people to use that form in order also to go out and perform to the people where they are. Beca so saying that, there is another problem that is also uh, connected to the fact that uh, the West Bank is completely broken. Um, and people cannot really move sometimes. They cannot really travel from one uh, city to another, from a village to another, uh, because there are checkpoints and the wall and all of that. And there is no uh, feeling that, um, or there is no um, urge 
for the audience to really go out uh, to seek uh, culture. But uh, they do go to see a, a performance when, uh, when a performance comes to, uh, to their community. Um, and that, that is why we go into uh, unconventional places. Sometimes we, uh, we perform under uh, the trees, sometimes in, uh, uh, in a courtyard, uh, um, sometimes in, uh, um, uh, in a place for um, weddings, <laughs> in a hall for weddings, but also um, saying this, that doesn't mean that there are no theater buildings. So all the theater groups that are working and, and they are really um, surmounting at the moment, uh, they do have uh, their own spaces. Like in Jenin, there is uh, the Freedom Theater. In, the Ma in Ramallah, there is um, Ashtar and uh, al Qasaba, And in Bethlehem, in Hebron, in, in Jerusalem, the National Theater. There are theater spaces, but every single uh, theater company, they know that if the, they do not take their work to the people, the people will not come to see their work, especially if they're not living in, in the city. What, um, what is your favorite or most moving, meaningful moment in your life with Ashtar Theater? There's many, but um, um, yesterday or, or the first day, we were, uh, the panelists were talking about hope. Um, for me, for us at Ashtar, uh, hope really becomes an empty, uh, an empty goal if it is only uh, the end of something. <laughs> if it becomes uh, what you aspire. Because for, for us, hope alone does not stand. Hope is, um, is only a pathway. You need it as your Lazzi, you know, in uh, Comedia dell'arte. You need to really take a little bit of hope in order to do something. You need an urgency. You need uh, an action to arrive to. You need um, a target to reach to, and hope could help you. Um, we cultivate with our young people and with the communities that we work with this kind of hope and urgency and action. Um, one of the moments um, and one of the projects that have resonated and uh, really deep in, in our history uh, of Ashtar Theater is the Gaza monologues. The Gaza monologues. Maybe some of you have heard of it. Um, that, that was, um, and that still is um, performed around the world until the moment more than 2,000 young people from around the world is still doing the Gaza monologues. Um, in, in universities and, but, <laughs> so the idea of, of that kind of, uh, of performance was to, um, to really uh, stimulate um, solidarity around the world towards the Gaza young people who are besieged and who are, until the moment, attacked. So 13 years, in, uh, 13 years ago, uh, the siege have started in Gaza. Two million people today are still imprisoned in Gaza. Two million people. It, it's the biggest prison on earth. And nothing has been done with and without theater. So, um, but whether there is still hope, whether we're taking this hope out of of the Lazi and, and, and use it, we have to. Otherwise, we stop doing what we're doing. Otherwise, we, <laughs> we see just the wall in front of our face. Um, so yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Faisal, you grew up in the Freedom Theater in Janine. Yes. And can you relate to what 
uh, Iman has said? Would you, yeah. Is it somewhat different? Yeah. What was that like? And what did it give you? I think you? Palestine and we all the same somehow. Like the same, there is no new story about what is like going on in Palestine. But uh, for me now, these days, I would like to, to, to speak about now, what is the theater doing now? Of course, especially Freedom Theater done very interesting, uh, powerful journey. All of the, this uh, from 2006 till now. And this month we are in Ramadan and the Freedom Theater there is every Thursday there is a Ramadan event with this stand-up comedy, hip-hop, uh, plays, uh, poetry, which is that's mean and that's a big thing to do this in Ramadan in a conservative community. So I'm sending uh, this chance, I'm sure everybody now in the Freedom Theater w waiting for me, so I'm sending them a hug and big kiss and yeah, let's be funny. Uh, what is the, uh, I want to talk about the theater now when I meant like the, th the Palestinian theater, in my opinion, we are a bit of a stuck, it's stuck in, because all the theater around, it's an NGO theaters, and we cannot like, you know, we cannot hide uh, this, and this is uh, affect our shows, and affect how we tell the story, which is that's very important for me to share, because what is happening, like when you want to tell a story, you are convinced, like you tell your story, but then you find out you tell the story that the Western want to hear. And that's a bit tricky because the, we are jumping between these two lines. That's, that's why I'm a big fan of comedy, of a clowning. I'm a big fan of agrarian work, of, uh, of these metaphoric poetry written. Because, you know, when we... You know, Palestinian, we have tags, and uh, like, you know, Palestine, you know, Palestinian, there is two expectations from you. First, are you a refugee? Uh, or, no, so, no, that's for later. First, it's, are you a victim? Second, or a terrorist? And your story is done, and everybody wants to feel good by hearing your, you know, how much it's possible, you know, and, and this is a language funding, which is, exists now very much, which is make me afraid, really afraid. But I have hope in the new generation who's coming, who's, who's more connected to, to the field, who's trying to break the stereotype of what is Palestinian theater and how, in which way we want to tell our story. Do we want to tell it in a funny story way? Do we want to tell it in a more tragedy? What we want to do? And I'm hoping with these people, with my friends, my colleagues, who are asking this question, what is the best way to tell the story as we want to tell it? And that's a challenge, and Freedom Theater, one of these places who are battling this, because we have a, usually meetings and conversation about, do I tell my story, or do I tell the story that Western world want to hear? Which is about, you know, being victim, and that makes the audience feel, feel a bit relief of their guilt. Uh, yeah, it's funny, it's funny, I'm glad you laugh, really. <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny because the, it, it's, it's, it's never-ending circle. And that's why I'm obsessed with comedy, because I found, now before that, I was when I, I grew up in a refugee camp, and I always obsessed with the idea, we are as a human, do we laugh first or we speak first? And it was really always like, what, how when humanity start, how we find laughter? Because, you know, laughter, it's an it's a, it's a international uh, language, you know, no doubt about it. If somebody laugh, he laugh. And you know sometimes they fake laugh, of course, but uh, but there is a, but there is this, I found it a way. It's more connection between me and the audience, and more not knowing because now I believe like Palestinian story is not a secret anymore. Like everybody going the occupation, the siege, the bad, the bad, really the, the tough situation. But what is missing is the understanding. And comedy, it's a way of like. It's make you understand things. And why, in my opinion, I think, I don't know, there's a lot of uh, analysis and a lot of ideas about why, why it's comedy, but from my small experience as a stand-up comedy and as a doctor clown in, uh, in hospitals, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, comedy make things personal. Like, it's become muttering to me. Instead of like having sympathy, like people will go to empathy. And that is my, one of my heroes I would like to share. I, it was big inspiration to me, Basim Youssef, the Egyptian comedian, which is like the Johnny Stewart of the Middle East. 
Like you know, Basim Yusuf was his uh, program, and during during uh, you know the the revolution in Egypt, everything gets upside down. In Jenin, like Jenin, it's a it's a town in nowhere, you know. But when Basim Yusuf come to the TV every Friday, nobody in the street, everybody in the cafe is waiting, and it was really shocking. What? Why Basim Yusuf doing that? How he succeed to 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 hold this community. And we are, you know, we related with Egypt by, by TV and by the cinema because we love how they speak. They speak beautifully. <laughs> and I found, yeah, Basim Yusuf succeed to make it personal. So we have to work on something, make it personal. And comedy, it's a, it's a way. Maybe there's another way, inshallah, in 10 years. But, but for now, and it's hard to approve that, you know, because you are in a, in, surrounded by NGOs theater everywhere. And to talk about this, and you know, people want to, you know, sexy language for the fund. You need a, a bit of, that's, that's, even if you, even if you are aware of it, even if you are aware of it, but living in Palestine, it's become uh, unconscious. You do it uh, naturally, you know, because it's been years and years and years and years. So it's not easy, guys, to have uh, this conversation. So my hope uh, which is happening this year which is our new play london janine it's a it's an independent production me ala and khawla that was our challenge because both of us agreed we want to do a comedy show related to us as a and it's a personal story about our tour in the uk as a comedian because we had a tour last year uh, with a british comedian mark thomas was was a huge thing for us and to discuss it with people, it's hard. How, how this play will get fun? Because, you know, how this play will work? How this play will work? And we had, like, we tried to, to make, like, a test uh, shows people. When people lo love it, they laugh. When they laugh, oh, my God. I said, ah, it's working. It's working. People related to us instead of uh, blah, 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 crying and all of this story about Palestine. It's okay. That's, if you want to see that, you can see it in the, you know, in the news. You can follow what, uh, what's going on. But we are artists. And there is different for me if you are an artist or activist. And uh, I, um, I, that's a big conversation, but it's good to define the, that and to make it clear like what is this connection and because seriously, I don't know what the activists mean. I try to, but I, maybe I, I still didn't get it yet. Uh, so when London Janine being selected by Sundance, it was a big hit, of course, because Sundance is a big deal. But what is the other thing happened to us? We approve to our friend and to our colleagues, there is other way we can make theater and not being victim all the time. And inshallah, it will come here maybe in two years. That's my plan. Absolutely. We're having the world are you premiere. Sure? Are you the sure? You know, Absolutely. Are you sure? Uh, yes, I am sure. Right? Okay. Yeah, right? uh, uh, you uh, recorded. Yeah, yeah. London Dean yeah, will come yeah, here yeah, when yeah. it's ready. World premiere. Yeah, that's what it is. World you know. premiere. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, guys, and uh, and yeah, I hope I hope capture many uh, like because you know this uh, I I I'm aware it's uh, this uh, panel it's two in one you know like two panels and one panels which is sometimes I try to push my thoughts uh, to to make it so precise and I'm sorry if I took uh, more time if, if, uh, from you guys but uh, yeah let's be funny and put the red nose and let's uh, you know express the story as it is without trying to being in a, a court of white people. Always. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I travel a lot uh, and, uh, around the world. I was lucky with it in my life. But in every show, you are in a court, you know? Like, everybody wants to solve the, uh, the, the Middle East thing through you. <laughs> Guys, come on, I'm just telling jokes, huh? <laughs> uh, like, I'm not uh, that person. And uh, yeah, so. World premiere coming up. World premiere coming up. And, you know, it's not that different. It, I think that evolution has already started in film. You know, I mean, 10 years ago, people told me they couldn't get any films from the Middle East funded unless it was invi involving violence and terrorism. Yeah. And now you have many more human stories. So yeah, which is you're interesting. the tip uh, of the spear there. Yeah, uh, yeah. And but just last thing from the Syrian experience, I uh, just it's come to my mind now because you remind me of it. I meet many Syrian friends who's uh, actors in, in, in festival and things. And they say something really interesting, like, look how this system works. They say, you know, Faisal, it's uh, every play talk about ISIS and about Islamic uh, extremes, it's easy to fund. And they, they want to bring it to Europe or to the United States. But every play talks about the Al-Assad regime, like how, uh, how, what is going on, nobody care about it. 
Because, you know, maybe I, I told them, in my opinion, I don't know, but I think, you know, when you talk about ISIS, it's more sexy on the stage for white people. So you have to play with this, which is, which is sad for me. I don't know. It's very sad. Like, you decide how you want to see the people. <laughs> you put, like, okay, I want to see this, guys, please. Uh, you know? So and I hope it will finish, and I believe in, in the new energy which is growing now in Palestine through many theaters around. Still tough, um, not everything fine. But, you know, we're trying, and I, yeah, if I'm here now, got the visa finally after, you know. So there is, a, there, there is still a kind of a hope, I hope. There's a, there is, I think there's a lot of it. I'm going to ask you one more quick question, then turn to... Um, other panelists, but give us just a little glimpse of what you're going to be working on with Derek in the next week or so. Uh, very, that's, very, that's very a tricky beginning. question, by the way. That's yeah. tricky because we decided we will not talk about it, but oh, you know, okay. we now it's not talk. a secret. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Uh, like, r t till now, uh, I don't know what we will work about. It's just, there is random ideas, random thoughts. Uh, we had like a couple of uh, brainstorming meetings. I'm staying here for an uh, extra week, hey, lucky me. So for, uh, for the, this production. Um, I don't know if I will share the idea with you or not, but still, uh, because it's still, it's still not clear. Uh, we want to do, shall I say it, Derek, or no? Where is Derek? Up to me? Oh my God. Well, for heaven's sakes, I'm sorry if I wasn't supposed to say it, but you got to say something now. I say what I want to say, Cynthia. <laughs> Give it away. <laughs> <laughs> no. The ideas came like we were in uh, South End with the Lab Fellows in, uh, in the UK doing uh, workshop, being theater. Everybody shared his experience with his uh, friends. And suddenly we, I was smoking outside. Uh, you know, I always love smoking and coffee, of course, as Palestinian. That's our sport. Suddenly, it's Derek, Derek uh, came to me, you know, he, he didn't smoke, he just came for company. <laughs> and uh, we were sharing well, what is the theater, and I mentioned, uh, we mentioned together, like, the discussion lead us to Merchant of Venice, which is a, a Shakespeare play. But I said, okay, we are not going to do Merchant of Venice, like, uh, it's a classic, but maybe, like, then we decide to do maybe something about Merchant of Venice. Not the play itself, but inspired by the play, some stories. And we want to do it as a comedy. Uh, you know, if Merchant of Venice, so go to comedy, that's... Uh, <laughs> I hope it will work. We still don't know how, but... Um, and we have a working title called... I hope I can say it. In Sooth. That's our working title. And uh, we still, we hope uh, we'll, it will be more clear in the coming weeks what, what it will look like, what is the play. Maybe we'll change it. Maybe we'll, you know, give everything, you know. So, yeah, that's I'm, what, what I'm looking for. Well, but something you told me which I found so intriguing was that growing up, that was the first Shakespeare you knew and the Shakespeare you knew the most. Merchant of yeah, Venice. yeah, yeah, that's true. Huh? You bring yeah. you bring uh, Yeah, yeah, it was just, just <laughs> yeah. an interesting thing. Yeah, yeah, it's very yeah. interesting. So, yeah, because stay tuned. But first, the world premiere, maybe. When? Well, first, we're, we're focused on the world premiere and also in Sooth. Okay. London Janine. Okay. London Janine first, because and it's just, almost sundown. So Got it. Yeah, so, so you have to totally do something for in Sooth so we yeah. can be, keep going. It's definitely going to keep going. Otherwise, you know. But how, um, isn't it so fantastic that he is going to be back at Sundance this summer working on this? And you just told me that Vasim Yusuf is also going to be working on a play there. Yeah, this which is like, that was, uh, that was for me more interesting than getting the news of Sundance, that Vasim <laughs> Yusuf is in the same time there for 10 days. Bas I love Vasim Yusuf so much. I always, he's always inspiring. And so he will work on something uh, called, uh, one man show called United, I think. Uh, but he has do it as an American production. And so I'm happy to hang out with him, looking forward, and to, yeah. to see who's funnier, yeah. Palestinian accent or <laughs> Egyptian. <laughs> it's going to be a comedy contest. It's going to be great. I hope so. Now, Shahid, you and your work in Pakistan, you use, I think, equally well and equally effectively history and humor. That's not so common to have someone who has both of those in their repertoire. And I'd love you to talk about the impact of both of them, some of your historical plays, and then also humor. I'd love to have you talk a little bit about Burka Vaganza and any other humor you want to talk about. 
Thank you. Um, well, uh, in Pakistan, um, uh, theater movement is also, although it's a big country, but theater movement is small, and especially is socially meaningful theater, activist theater. Um, and I think artists are all activists, so you can't define them. That this is an activist and this is an artist. So that is small, and we started uh, exactly 35 years ago, uh, Ajoka, um, when um, we had a military rule which was also very strongly uh, fundamentalist. So, and they had full backing of uh, American uh, and Western powers because of the Soviet, uh, anti-Soviet struggle in Afghanistan. So that was the time when we started. And there were three or four ch challenges. One is the, the narrative, the state narrative, uh, which is given to us that Pakistan uh, is made for the glory of Islam and it is totally different from India and art and culture or music have no uh, room in Islam. Then there was uh, this um, state security narrative that you should not talk about peace or anything in common with the India. Then there, there were extremists who uh, were given a lot of uh, encouragement by the establishment. Uh, and then there was the this global factors like um, television and uh, um, DVDs and um, so later on social media. So, and then it was a conservative society, especially for women to appear on theater. So we had all these challenges. And uh, there have been ups and downs. There have been governments which have been less hostile and governments which have been more hostile. The um, religious extremists sometimes they are really breathing uh, down your neck, uh, very close to you and threatening you. And sometimes they are um, like occupied in a struggle with, with the authorities. So what we have learned, how we have survived uh, these 35 years is firstly is personal commitment, that there has to be a strong personal commitment of the people, core people who are involved. Secondly, you have to be flexible. You should not depend on resources, state resources, international funding, or any uh, patrons you have, because they can, uh, if you are doing a provocative and uh, socially critical theater, then uh, anytime they can withdraw their support and uh, you will not know what to do. And thirdly, we do not focus on individual dictators. We focus on changing the mindset, changing the system, so that um, uh, if, one dictator or one authoritarian ruler is replaced by another one, then we are not at a loss that uh, why things are not changing. So in these circumstances, we have like, in terms of venues, if we get the halls, the censorship authorities give us, we use it and we use it to the fullest possible extent. If they don't give it, we find an alternative venue. If the alternative venues are not available, we find a courtyard, street, or even house lawn. So that is one way of survival. Secondly, which you have mentioned, history and humor, that sometimes um, hitting uh, straight on the face can have consequences, and you can achieve the same uh, um, um, objective by going back to history and bringing stories which are as relevant and very uh, obviously relevant to today. Uh, like uh, there is a story about uh, two uh, Mughal princes uh, in the 17th century India, uh, my play Dara, which was later on uh, presented in an adaptation form by National Theater in London. So it's a story between a fundamentalist and a Machiavellian and narrow-minded uh, prince, Muslim of course, and, and a Sufi, poet and scholar and uh, all uh, uh, embracing kind of a character. So their struggle, uh, when we present it today, people immediately related to two varying interpretations of Islam today. So that is one way. Adaptation is another way. And Brecht uh, I'm is I'm just going to stop for one second on Dara, just so they understand, because I think it's such an interesting story and has such direct relevance. Are you, are you moving on from Dara, or are you still talking about Dara? No, I, I'm now moving on to okay. I'm, I'm going back. I love the Dara story. Sorry, we're going back to Dara. Just because the, the struggle is between Dara Shiko and his brother, Oren Zabe. And the, Oren Zabe was a fairly difficult 
person wanted to be in charge of things and did put his brother Dara the Sufi on trial and have his head chopped off and uh, delivered to his father, Shah Jahan, who built the Taj Mahal. And so when Shahid tells, and, and Orrin Zabe was chosen by the military dictator as to yeah. be the kind of father of the country. So these are very real live people in people's lives. So there's a portrait of Orrin Zabe in every government office. And so Shahid does this play that shows that Orrin Zabe actually had his brother and, and other siblings too killed. And so then you were questioned by the parliament. You know, can you yeah, really put uh, that on? So, so, but that was uh, the, another play. Uh, but before <laughs> I quickly mention the Brecht phenomenon that sometimes we adapt plays which are uh, uh, on very similar uh, situations, maybe uh, uh, pre-war uh, Germany or, um, or Spain or, or some other uh, uh, Indian context. And sometimes we get away with it and we say it's a foreign play, it's a German play, it's a Spanish play. And after a while, maybe after several performances, somehow they realize that this has so direct relevance. So sometimes they ban it and they say uh, that uh, this is an original play and you are just using Brecht as a cover. Although this is not true, but this is one strategy by which we can get away with things. And the third, of course, is humor. Because humor is something which uh, softens uh, uh, even the rigid minds. And if uh, there are all kinds of humors and all kinds of comedy shows, and some are very of a very low standard, uh, very um, uh, kind of uh, derogatory to women or minorities or people from uh, uh, lower classes. But if the humor has some cultural substance and some social substance, then it, has, it, it can have tremendous impact. I'll give you one example, uh, of sometimes very dry and very dark, like Burqa Vaganza is a play which, uh, in which everyone wears a burqa, all actors, male, female. So there, is, uh, um, uh, there are lovers who are in uh, 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 colorful designer burqas, and there is uh, um, a terrorist leader who's called Burqa bin Batin. So <laughs> And then uh, there are, um, there's an American astronaut wearing Ku Klux or uh, the astronaut cover. So all kind of covers are uh, presented there. So, and we have no, make no comment whether burqa is mandatory in Islam or not, which is a debate which goes on in Muslim societies. But while this is going on, it's all song and dance and parody of uh, uh, film or Bollywood songs. On two sides of the stage, we have two religious scholars who are uh, replying to answers on television or radio about some issues uh, of today. And their answers are taken exactly from some very uh, sacred religious texts. And they seem so outlandish and so irrelevant to the problems of today, uh, the way they are, they are uh, formulated, so that people laugh. And uh, uh, so we were asked by a government advisor who came to see a play, uh, unfortunately, uh, her daughter brought him <laughs> in the play, uh, to see the play. And he said that uh, you, uh, this was quite uh, derogatory and um, blasphemous, and why did you do it? I, I said, well, we just were quoting text, and we didn't add a single word from, uh, or single full stop. He said, but everyone was laughing at it. So I said, blame the audience, not blame the <laughs> theater people. <laughs> so, so the play was banned, and then it was, uh, it was brought. To, the matter was brought to the Senate Culture Committee, and then it was. Uh, we kept on performing. Instead of Burka Vaganza, we gave it a different name. So, uh, so uh, uh, we again performed. So it was one play which was banned again. So it was banned twice, and. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, but the fun was that even um, uh, we, uh, women audience who were wearing burqas, they came and they enjoyed the play <laughs> because the play was not uh, provoking or derogatory. It was just making people, giving an, give an image how it would be if everyone was wearing a burqa. So, uh, so that's uh, how sometimes we get away 
with the, uh, there is third thing which maybe somewhere it fits in is the use of music. So music also, because we don't have separate categories, so music also sometimes we can say things which we can't say in prose or in, uh, in dialogues. And people enjoy the music and they get involved and they sometimes don't realize uh, the content is different. If it's a parody of a popular song, they enjoy the theme, but the, the text is completely different from what uh, it was intended to be. So, so these are tactics by which we some, sometimes get away with things, and that's why we have addressed every sensitive issue in Pakistan, which people are not uh, willing to discuss even in private, but we have addressed it in public like the issue of blasphemy laws, where if you just uh, are mildly critical of a blasphemy law, then you are considered a, a blasphemer, and the uh, convicted blasphemer has only one penalty, which is death penalty, it is mandatory. But for the last uh, two decades, we have been doing a play which is based on cases of misuse of blasphemy law, and we have been presenting it uh, everywhere to general audience, not any selected audience. And uh, we didn't have any serious problem because uh, the way we are presenting the uh, story with some dark humor, with some funny uh, scenes, and then in between, without identifying that this is about a certain law or certain mindset, you just create the humanitarian crisis which, is, which it is creating. So you can get away with it. Family planning is another issue. No one wants to talk about it. They think that this is against our religion, against our culture. But we did a play on not only family planning, but also vasectomy. And this, this is very precisely the case for vasectomy or family planning is discussed. But in such a way that women, children, old people, conservative, they all are having a great time because there is no way, uh, the, whatever the, the message is, you cannot see it, you just feel it, or you receive it, but uh, you, uh, you can get away with it. Well, it's, it's an amazing body of work. I really recommend all of you to look up Shahid's plays. I don't know anyone who vacillates so easily from really deep history right into these hilarious uh, parodies. And Joanna, you work uh, also with, particularly with women, but with populations all over the world. Let's focus on your work in Afghanistan where you engage people, sometimes relating directly to challenges they are facing in their lives. And you also weave a little humor in there. We do, yeah, I think it's on. No? I just, I think if you no. hold it up, it'll work. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, humor is definitely very important and uh, we, we started working in Afghanistan uh, right after 9-11, and uh, our, our uh, I idea was to help revive theater, because under the Taliban, of course, there was no, no arts. I mean, it's hard to imagine now, but like, no music. No, can you imagine? No music, no art, no theater, no nothing. So uh, we lived at uh, Kabul University on the floor, and just that was one of the non bombed out buildings. And uh, uh, they said, well, we're gonna have a theater festival. And we said, how can you have a theater festival? There's no theater. And you know, they had 50 applicants. And it just, uh, they came from just all over, all over Afghanistan. These little theater companies immediately cropped up out of nowhere. And it just restored my faith that, you know, theater and uh, Storytelling is intrinsic to human nature. You can't have people not tell stories. And the, the storytellers of Kabul, of, of um, Afghanistan, are, are famous before the Taliban came in. And they are hysterical, because we went to visit some of the storytellers out in the villages, and um, very scatological and um, crazy, and they'll take a story like uh, being captured by the Russians and falling into the latrine and what, what that was like. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> I just glossed over that, <laughs> yeah. 
but the, you know, the, the, the theater festival, we noticed that there were no women. You know, you have 50 theater groups and there were absolutely no women. And uh, the theater was on a very low level also. It was about like third grade level where people are standing in front of each other and you know, it was kind of chaotic. Uh, but we were determined to get women on the stage. And uh, you know, similar to Pakistan, it's very difficult. But we said, well, look, if, if women are just performing for women, then it should be okay, right? And we went and talked to the mullahs, and they said, yes, if, if the women are just performing for women. And we invited them to come see what we were doing. So we started to you know, um, have the women start to tell their own stories and talk about that. But like NGO theater, we were sometimes given a, a task, like when the elections came up, we have these women's theater groups, wouldn't it be nice if they informed women that they had the right to vote? So we did, in fact, create shows about the elections. And we did take them into women's homes from house to house to do these stories about how to vote. I mean, it was theater about how you vote. What is it like? You walk in a door and the bus is gonna pick you up and don't worry, there's not gonna be any men and you have to sign your name or you put your thumbprint. I mean, really just theater to inform the public, uh, uh, the, the women, that they have the right to vote. And at the same time, the men's theater companies did shows for the men about women having the right to vote. So, you know, we have to keep all bases covered. Uh, <clears throat> it's very important for the plays, all the plays, for the men or for the women, to include comedy, because you want people to watch them. And <laughs> comedy is entertaining. So uh, I'll, I'll talk about both the men and the women. The uh, women's, um, shows that we created with the women, and they had never done theater, they never saw theater, so we've gotten very good at working with people that have never done theater in their life. They, um, it's very important to like include just a couple of comic characters. You know, maybe it's the funny uncle, or it's the gossipy neighbor, and very often we use the structure of having a narrator, or two narrators, and they're kind of the go-between the audience and the action on the stage. So if you're talking about something very depressing, like uh, one of the stories about a 13-year-old girl who's being sold to uh, a, an older man to be the second wife, and she's really an energetic 13-year-old who's really involved in school, and she loves it, and um, her, her neighbor is a, an, also a girl who's just going off to college, she's gonna be a doctor, and she just wants to be a doctor, just like her neighbor friend. And suddenly she finds out she's gonna be married. So, you know, it's a really this tragic story and um, the gossipy neighbors, they're the ones that are the narrators. And they come out onto this, the, the, and they ask the audience their point of view. So this is kind of a dialogue with the audience throughout the show about whether that's the right thing to, to do or not. And of course, one is kind of the naysayer and one is the one who's like, no, girls should be able to go to school. And the other one is like, no, girls should just, you know, the next thing you know, she'll be wearing lipstick and you know, high heels or whatever. So um, the, the gossipy neighbors were very funny and at the same time elicited responses from the audience throughout the whole show. For the men, they um, are performing in marketplaces because there were no theaters. I mean, there's still not, real, not really many theaters in Afghanistan. Uh, so they're pulling up to a par marketplace. How are they gonna get a crowd? By doing these funny bits. So they'll do like a whole pre-show kind of funny business, and then they'll do the show. And of course, the show has comedy in it as well. And this is the only way you're gonna have people in a marketplace stick around to get your great message about women's rights or uh, anything, basically. And uh, uh, like you were saying that artists are activists, you know, they, they invented most of their own shows, both the women's groups and the men's groups. We, you know, help them to create a show about what it is that they want to talk about, uh, whatever issues on their mind. So. Um, that could be a, a wide range. We, we've worked in Afghanistan since 2001, so we've covered a lot of territory, worked with a lot of different groups and a lot of different topics. But the essential thing is, is that they're 
writing it themselves, and um, now they're great. Uh, you know, now these groups are on their own. We created a, a women's theater group at Kandahar, Nangarhar, Kabul, and Herat. And uh, they're still existing. And then also one in Mazar is also doing very well. That's and an incredible legacy. I'm sorry to interrupt yeah, you, no, but we're no. not only running out of time, but we yeah. have run out of time. But, but I want, and I want to save just a minute to turn to Nick, so yeah. I'm sorry, but I am really going to encourage everyone, check out the Bond Street Theater website, and you can see examples of this incredible work taking on so many different issues. Now, Nick, you are not from the world of theater. Oh, you are. Okay. I'm from Iran. Iran is a big theater. Okay, I was going to say, we have, we haven't even talked about Iran at all. So, in like five minutes or less, tell us everything we need to know about Iran, and please make it wow. funny. Sure, sure. Actually, these are original. I just wrote them down here. In Iran, people are always acting. The majority hates actually many religious values that have been imposed on them. They don't, many don't like to fast during Ramadan, honestly, honestly. And then they pretend to be observing Ramadan, but then they go to their bathrooms or anywhere in the office and eat. And they are so, uh, they're very good actors in a way that they believe in what they're doing. They hate Ayatollahs, then they go and vote for them and keep them in power. That's, that's beautiful, they're, they're always acting. Uh, and when I heard the word uh, Gaza monologue, I thought, oh, it's, I thought it was about the Hamas monologue because they just, they don't believe in dialogue. So it's, it's like that in, uh, in Iran as well. The Ayatollahs love only the monologue. They don't like a dialogue. But what I have learned as an Iranian who has traveled all around the world is that... Uh, we are always learning from each other, basically through humor, because humor is a tool, is a way of communication. I learned from Shahid's play about the things that are happening in Pakistan and how people are dealing with the government over there. I learned from other plays that I've seen. <coughs> and many people can actually learn from the theatrics of Iranian politics if they pay more attention. Trump wants, to, wants them to call, they say that, oh, we'll give our, we'll give our phone number if Trump wants to call us. So it's, it's, it's something funny happening. In Iran, we usually play with words. And that actually uh, put me in trouble, a lot of trouble. I drew a, a cartoon related to an ayatollah whose name rhymed with crocodile. His last name is Mesba. I Temsa in Persian means crocodile. So, I mixed them up. I created a national security crisis. 4,000 clergy students and clerics actually went on a four-day protest. They called for my death all around the country for a cartoon that most of them hadn't even seen. So the thing is, I just played with the word. And then if you pay attention to words and how you can make fun of words and how you can use them, if like you, you're a um, you've just entered the United States and it's hard for you to pronounce three syllable words like you say philosopher but the guy says piss all over. <laughs> oh, so, or like when he said I'm um, Faisal Abul Hijack, I said oh Faisal Abul Hijack because we have been hijacked by the <laughs> regime. So if I want to say yes, Iranian politics is like a a theater, a, a comic theater, a dark humor comic theater. And um, as, as somebody who went to prison and faced uh, different type of charges from uh, actually pissing off an Ayatollah to insulting the religion, and I, was, I could have possibly gotten a death penalty, it wasn't optional as well, it was mandatory. It's like a form, you want to get killed or it's mandatory, you have to fill it up. Yeah. I, I, they would have killed me for that. But I, I, was, I got a death threat because I continued my work, not only as a cartoonist, but as somebody who was working on water issues, and my work was pissing off the Revolutionary Guards who are building so many dams that have destroyed Iran's water resources. So, yes, I escaped from that great theater. I ended up here. I'm very happy to be here on this stage. 
I, so I moved from Jerktown to Georgetown. So <laughs> I'm so happy about that. And uh, I always, in some meetings, I wear this shirt because I want some people to feel bad. Of course, I'm not you. I think you have to read your shirt. Maybe yeah, everyone so can read it. I'm sorry I hurt your feelings when I called you stupid. I really thought you already knew. This is what I always <laughs> tell the <laughs> Iranian politicians. Thank you very much. Bravo, Nick. What a wonderful way to wrap up. Did you want to have a final thing? I think we're out of time, final but if thing? you want a final thing? No, because, we, because when my friend mentioned uh, the words, blank on words, I remember first time I applied for a visa. You know, there is, what is your last occupation? I write Israel. <laughs> 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 oh, let me tell that. Yeah, for, for an Iranian, when they, when they write sex, male or female, so no, I don't have time for that. They, they have a, b a bad understanding. <laughs> okay, next time you guys are doing the late night comedy show for sure. Thank you, everyone. You were all super patient. I'm sorry it wasn't even everyone to get the same amount. And please seek these people out. So, Peg, thank you for making the long journey. It was fantastic to get a glimpse of your work. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for doing this. Are we going straight to you, Derek? No, we're going to take a, we're a little, we're a little bit behind. We're going to, uh, and yeah, endings are harder than beginnings, but we want to try to do it together and well. So we're going to take, we're going to try to take a real 10-minute break. Okay. And come back and then we'll cut some things. And then come back for the performing one another.